So other FBI teams had been targeting the Lucchese's, the Colombo's, the Genovese's. Now it was time to pull all those far-flung researches together. No living New York mob executive was beyond the reach of the commission case. Considering the sheer scope of it, not the least remarkable thing about the commission case was how long and how faultlessly it had been kept a secret. As 1985 began and the time for the handing down of the indictments grew nearer, the risk of leaks grew ever more severe. Yet no one talked. No one goofed. Nothing was allowed to spoil the grand spectacle that was being planned. A great and all-inclusive roundup of mob bosses and their underbosses. Nearly a score of simultaneous surprise arrests made all over New York by almost 50 agents. At 7.25 p.m. on February 25th, traveling in convoy with two other agents in a following car, Joe O'Brien and Andy Kearns took what was, for them, the very familiar ride to the mansion on Tote Hill. But the resonance of this trip was different from what it had been on any of their many dozens of previous drive-bys. Now they were going to arrest Big Paul. Theirs would be the high honor and ambivalent pleasure of bringing in America's most powerful mobster to be charged in the most significant mafia prosecution ever. Who is it? The voice was unmistakably Castellanos. He didn't sound like he was expecting company. It's Joe O'Brien, Mr. Castellano, FBI. I have a warrant for your arrest. Ah, came the reply. The syllables seemed to hold only slight surprise and slight concern. Soon the front door opened. Paul Castellano appeared, his tall and rather hulking body filling most of the dim rectangle of yellow light. He was wearing gray slacks, a pale blue silk shirt, and his almost dainty slippers. His voice was without anger. May I ask what this is? Rico conspiracy, said O'Brien, showing the warrant. A dozen or so of your colleagues are being arrested right now, sir. Really, said the godfather, right now. He glanced out over the bay as if he could picture his comrades being confronted all around the city. Well, uh, come in. Silently, the godfather led the agents to the kitchen. Hello, Gloria, said O'Brien. Castellano's maid and mistress did not answer. Her posture was rigid and her eyeballs were bulging. Be civil, Castellano coaxed her. The man's only doing his job. His job? His job? His job is only to make trouble for other people who they don't do nothing. I don't like this Mr. Yo O'Brien. Oddly, Castellano smiled. Perhaps he felt vindicated to hear his lover renounce the agent. I'd like to change into a suit. That isn't necessary, said O'Brien. I know it ain't, but I'd feel more comfortable. I'm asking as a favor. Kearns and O'Brien glanced at each other. Their instructions were to bring Castellano in as quickly and as smoothly as possible. No fireworks, no delays. He was going to jail, not a party. But greatness had its prerogatives, and to the agents, standing there in his kitchen, there was a greatness about Paul Castellano. He may not have been a good man. In many ways, he was an appalling one. But he had shrunk from nothing. He'd seen it all, and he'd taken monstrous vows and stuck to them. Certain people it is just plain wrong to embarrass. After all, the king is allowed the royal purple, even at his beheading. So Paul Castellano was allowed to change his clothes. He went up to his bedroom, accompanied by Gloria and Dr. Hoffman. Then the doorbell rang. Joe O'Brien said hello through the intercom. Joe, said one of the sentinels, there are some people here, uh, relatives, they want to come in. Who? The daughter, uh, the son-in-law, their baby and the wife. Oh, shit. O'Brien glanced at his watch. Big Paul had been upstairs just over four minutes. He must have asked Gloria to call Connie, who lived just around the corner. Nina was probably there visiting. Okay, let them in. A moment later, Connie marched into the kitchen. Where's my father? Upstairs changing, answered O'Brien. Nina seemed to be sleepwalking. Joe Catalanati, Connie's second husband, trailed the women. He was carrying his infant daughter. Big Paul returned to the kitchen, wearing a midnight blue suit and a red silk tie, flanked by Dr. Hoffman and Gloria. He briefly greeted his family and kissed his granddaughter. There followed a moment of consummate awkwardness. Gloria started to cry. But she didn't cry like normal people, for whom tears are a release of tension. 
She actually got more rigid as she sobbed, her wet face crazily immobile. Castellano embraced her as his daughter looked on in rage and disgust. Nina drifted even farther off behind her vacant eyes. When Gloria had stopped bawling for a moment, it was Nina's turn to break down. She cried softly, almost silently. Then she opened her arms toward her estranged husband and started running toward him, running slowly with small old woman's steps that seemed to advance her hardly at all. The godfather's face riffled through a number of expressions as the mother of his children inexorably approached. First he looked baffled, then nonplussed, then as close to panic as the agents ever saw him. At the last possible moment he ducked right, and his wife, empty-armed, ran right past him. She ended up hugging Andy Kearns. I think it's time, said O'Brien. Dr. Hoffman handed Paul Castellano a bag full of insulin, syringes, and medical instructions. The godfather seemed almost relieved to be going. He led the procession to his own front door and walked briskly down the portico steps to the government Plymouth. Thanks for not handcuffing me in front of my family. This was the first thing the Godfather said as the car door was closed behind him. I know the drill. You're supposed to handcuff me. It was kind of you not to. The agents found it difficult to respond to his gratitude, and the little two-car convoy set off in silence, the Sentinels in the lead car, Andy Kearns driving the other, with Castellano and O'Brien sitting in the back. At Richmond Road, the cars turned left toward the Veranzano Bridge, and Kearns put an all-news station on the radio. This just in, the newscaster said. At this moment, agents of the Federal Bureau of Investigation and the New York State Organized Crime Task Force are arresting the reputed leaders of all of New York's five mafia families. According to U.S. Attorney Rudolph Giuliani, the arrests are part of the most far-reaching mob investigation ever, an investigation aimed at convicting the entire mob leadership, the so-called commission, under federal racketeering statutes. Tonight's arrests cap a four-year law enforcement effort, which, according to one highly placed source, included the 1983 bugging of the Staten Island home of Paul Castellano, alleged boss of the Gambino family and de facto head of the commission. Andy Kearns watched the road. Joe O'Brien looked straight ahead. The godfather leaned forward so as not to miss a word. Then he gave a little groan. Is that true? Did you guys bug my house? No doubt he was using you guys generically. He could not have known that O'Brien and Kearns were the very ones who had planted the microphone. Yes, sir, said O'Brien. I'm afraid it is. Yes, Cristo. When? How'd you do it? I'm sorry we can't tell you that. No, I suppose you can't. His chin collapsed onto his chest and he became totally subdued. After a few minutes, he said softly, I don't, I don't feel too good. Do uh, you think we could stop for some candy bars? Andy Curran sought out Joe O'Brien's eyes in the rearview mirror. Stopping would be highly irregular and would pose a security risk, but the man was ill and could go into a diabetic coma. O'Brien nodded yes, and Curran's notified the other car on the two-way. Are Hershey bars okay? Curran's asked in the parking lot of a 7-Eleven. Uh, Snickers, if they have them. Castellano wolfed down two candy bars. They brought him around incredibly fast. They continued on toward the bridge. Bugging a man's house. I'm sorry, fellas. I know you got your job to do, but I don't think that's right. Place of business, okay. Social club, okay, all right. But a man's home, it's personal. No one needs to know what a man says or does when he's home. I'm sure you know all sorts of things about me that no one really has the right to know. There's this thing called minimization, said O'Brien. We try not to listen to personal stuff. The godfather gave his big head an unpersuaded shake. No, you're trying to spare my feelings. But I know, you know, you know all about my marriage, you know all about glory in me. You know all about me, about my health. Yeah, you even know about my dick. The agents were too abashed to speak, but Castellano went on, a note of goading defiance in his voice. Come on, boys, don't be squeamish. The body's just the body. 
They traveled along in silence. Then the boss said, I knew there was something there. That's what gets me. I had the house swept twice. You probably know that. You probably know a lot of things. How bad does it look for me? Very bad, sir. Instantly, Castellano seemed depressed. He leaned back against the vinyl upholstery and rubbed his eyes. He ate some tums and stared sullenly out the window. The courtyard of 26 Federal Plaza could be seen from a long way off. It was lit with the biting blue-white of television lights and peppered with the little shocks of strobes. All the networks were there, as well as newspaper men and radio reporters. From the number of government vehicles parked at curbside, it seemed clear that most, if not all, of the other mobsters had already been brought in. The grand entrance of Paul Castellano, the godfather whose house had been bugged, would be the climax of the media carnival. Andy Kearns looked over his shoulder at Joe O'Brien. These people are vultures. I say let's duck them. Do it. Currens floored the Plymouth and screeched past the news hounds. They drove around to the dark side of the building, where a guarded ramp led down to the employees-only garage. There 